welcome to the Virtual Physiatry Mentors. I'm Dr. Sheena Bubba. I'm Dr. Benicia Williams. And together we are Shanisha. <laughs> I gotta do that dance at the end of every video. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we have an exciting guest here today. We have Dr. Satya Bandari. She is a rare feel the PMNR in the sense that she is a solo uh, physician working by herself in private practice. So um, I know it's a lot of hard work to do that. So we'll go into detail about what that entails, the pros and cons, and and how she got to where she was. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> to have you, this rare species. <laughs> so, Safia, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Tell us your educational, where you're from, educational background, and um, lo location of your current practice. So, I, it's going to be a little bit of a longer story than than I think most. Um, I started off uh, at Rutgers University in uh, New Jersey, and so I've basically grown up most of my, uh, well, since the sixth grade um, in New Jersey. And um, I, there was a opportunity for, for me to try out for that seven year MD pro, MD, uh, BAMD program there. So I started there, got in and then started medical school in uh, my junior year, which I have to say, I was thinking about it. I was like, what year was that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens to be 1997, ouch, <laughs> a long time ago. Never guessed it, never would have guessed it. <laughs> So I started then. Um, I was blessed to do that. That was actually really a great opportunity for me. So it did that. And it was interestingly enough, out of the seven that were in that program, three of us all became physiatrists, which is oh, kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then after that, I uh, went to Mount Sinai for my uh, residency program. Soon after that, I, after, and I thought I knew everything. <laughs> as most seniors right. think they knew everything. So I said, oh, I'm done with this. I just, you know, at that, at that time and, um, you know, in the early 2000s, um, thinking about an interventional pain was, um, it was very competitive for physiatrists. You know, most of the, most of the spots were really reserved for anesthesiology. And even at Mount Sinai, I mean, I think we had just at that program and the interventional pain program had um, had two physiatrists in that program. So, and that was the first um, that were in that program. So I decided to, I, I was just done. I was tired, you know, um, starting med school early was, was hard enough. And so I had my daughter and was ready. So I actually did a little bit of subacute rehab um, for about a year and then um, had the opportunity with my husband to go to Dubai for a few years. And I did, um, I had a, had my son and then I did pediatric rehab uh, for a year um, in Dubai because there was really nobody doing peds rehab. And um, there was a lot of need for that. And I and, um, had the opportunity to do that for a year and then came back and um, for a um, ANEM conference in, uh, in California and um, had this kind of I guess it was an interview because I was offered the fellowship um, for an interventional spine slash EMG uh, dual fellowship at Michigan State. So then um, went to that afterwards. So I moved the whole family back from Dubai <laughs> to Michigan State. Um, and then now, uh, and then I took a job in uh, Flower Mound, Texas, which is uh, outside of Dallas. So, um, and so my, um, practice now is uh, Liberty Pain Associates, and that's uh, still in Flower Mound in, in outside of Dallas. Great. I don't think I knew about that Dubai stint and the pediatric rehab. Yeah, and all so that. cool. So that's the, the beauty of PM&R. We have a very uh, diverse practice, so diverse field for sure. Um, so we ask all our guests, since PM&R is quite small, like, how did you hear about PM&R? Um, and then when I guess you kind of answered the question about when you went, uh, decided to do the fellowship. And at that time, was it still the two year fellowship that it is now? I think one of our attendings, actually Dr. Mukherjee, he did that same fellowship. I don't know if, if you know him, but um, oh, yeah. yeah so, so tell us a little bit about kind of why um, or how did you learn about PMR? Because we have some medical students here and sometimes they don't hear about it until 
you know, their third or even fourth year of medical school. And that was the same for me. So I was categorical medicine and I, and I, that's how I, um, in my intern year, I was categorical and, oh, wow. um, it was going to do nephrology. That was my kind of my goal, but I soon realized that, you know, I, I wanted to do something where I saw progress and I felt like medication management wasn't something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And uh, I mean, as I said, like seven, there were seven of us in that little group We got pretty close. And then there are two of them were like, well, you should look at physiatry. I was like, what's that? <laughs> They're like, you know, we, and then, so when I, once I looked into it, I realized that I just loved it. You know, I, doing my third year rotation, I, I loved, um, orthopedics. I loved musculoskeletal medicine. I loved rheumatology. I liked neurology. Um, uh, I loved internal medicine. I, you know, other than OBGYN, <laughs> I loved every, every one of those things. And, um, I really felt as though physiatry, um, comprised all of the, all of that. And then what I loved about it was that you could, you know, see progress in your patients and you could make such a difference in their lives. Um, that's when I, you know, so it was kind of by accident that I decided I discovered physiatry because I was looking for something that was going to be fulfilling. And I and I can say to you today, yeah, that was definitely a the right decision for me because I love what I do. So you talked about it a little bit. So tell us the type of practice you joined right after your fellowship and when and why you decided to start your own practice. And then um, we talk about our mentor all the time as we're in private practice. You're one of our mentors. We ask questions. You know, we have a nice network of um, ladies we get to talk to. Um, did you have network uh, network of mentors that kind of helped you along the way? Um, I I did. So I heard I already had done the substitute rehab route. I knew that that wasn't something that I really wanted to do long term. I. I was always getting my nose into trouble. Like I wanted to, uh, <laughs> I wanted to change medications and nobody wanted me to let, wanted me to change medicines. And, you know, so it, it, I just felt like I was paralyzed, um, in, in the group that I was in anyway, I'm sure it's different everywhere else you go, but that was the only job that I had to, or I have to, to reference. Um, and then, um, I really like the whole interventional part of it. That's something that I love doing things with my hands. I'm pretty a pretty creative person, so I, I you know I I enjoy that. So when I went to fellowship, I decided you know where was I going to go afterwards. We had kind of the whole entire United States to be able to choose from. Um, I only I interviewed like um, New Jersey, you know Pennsylvania, and then uh, Texas. And sounds weird, but that was just kind of I'm from that area. And then my husband's family um, was in Dallas uh, for a while, so that's kind of why we picked it. I started um, with an orthopedic group, so I was their first physiatrist or first ever interventional physician that came, you know, to that group. And I was also the only female in that group, so that was it was different. <laughs> um, the, it was, I think now it's grown. I think it's probably about 10, maybe even 11 physicians, but initially it was probably like eight. Um, and then I was a ninth, I believe. Um, overall it was a, a great group to work with. Um, I fell in love with, um, cause they made me feel like a human being when I interviewed with them. And I think that that's something that all of you all who are interviewing should really pay attention to because how they're going to treat you in an interview is probably the best they're ever going to treat you. <laughs> so they're not treating you very well during the interview. It's probably not, you know, the, the place for you to be. And, um, and I had great interviews, but when I came to Texas, I really felt like a human being. I felt like people were listening to me. They cared about where I went to school. They they cared that I was board certified. That about my skill set, the kind of person I was. Um, they weren't, you know, shoving um, injections down my throat, saying, "Oh, you got to do this many injections." Um, and and I, I valued that more than than just you know my paycheck. Um, so. We came down here. Um, I I loved it. I think it was a great fit for me. Um, I could. I never felt like I felt never felt different from any of them. But financially, it just wasn't a good fit. They were really looking for somebody that was an orthopedic surgeon 
to um, take over um, similar responsibilities financially as an orthopedic surgeon. And, you know, we just do not have the same type of um, financial reimbursement, um, you know, that orthopedic surgeons do. So, I mean, there was just no way I was going to be able to do that. So then I went on and I looked around and I said, okay, where else can I go? And I joined an interventional, sorry, I joined a, a pain group, um, thinking that that was a good idea. And I soon realized that that was just not like within six months, I knew it wasn't the good, it wasn't a good fit for me anyway. Um, and so I had um, a few other female physicians in the area that I had known already. Um, and when I reached out to them, just to kind of talk to them about what was going on, they, and they were both solo physicians, they said, and they're primary care doctors, they said, why don't you start your own group, or your own, you know, office? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> because nobody ever does that, especially if we're from the Northeast. I mean, like nobody joins their own. I mean, um, uh, everybody joins the group. Nobody makes their own. I mean, that's just bizarre. So I, I was like, no way. There's no way. They're like, no, you can do it. You know, you know, a little cheerleader in the background. And I was like, okay, okay, I can do this. I don't know whether I was just really, um, I, I, I mean, I, I believed in them and they, I guess they believed in me as well. Um, so I just sat down and I, and I started from there and, um, looked at the finances, thought it was a good idea and, uh, and then just went for it. So you gotta do, you just gotta go for it. Um, and, and Benicia, is, uh, Benicia and I have talked about, um, you know, how nice it is to kind of work for yourself, all the autonomy and all that. So, um, it seems very ideal. You're on your own boss. There's not enough, uh, not a lot of bureaucracy and things you have to kind of uh, ask permission for and anything. But obviously, there are some downsides as well to being a solo um, private practice physician. So can you talk a little bit about that? And then kind of what are things that if someone wants to start their own practice, what are some things that they should be aware of? And what have you learned throughout the years of you, you know, with your practice? Okay, so let's talk about the downsides first. I think that was that was a question, right? So um, let's talk about the upsides first before we talk about the downsides. Um, it's sorry. a balance. <laughs> they balance each other. Um, there's a plane flying over me right now, but um, so the upsides. One is that uh, what does it mean to be your own boss? It means that you answer to yourself. So if you want to work four days a week, you work four days a week. If you want to work from seven to three or seven to two that, you know, uh, you can, um, you want to see 30 patients, 50 patients, 15, you can, I mean, you want to see mostly EMGs, you can. Um, and the one thing that I loved about, or I love about being my own boss is that there's nobody calling me asking me why I haven't done, like, um, why didn't you do this many urine drug screens this, this month? Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> just. Like no one overlooking your work, <laughs> questioning your work, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I think it, in the sense that, I mean, there's always, you know, obviously ethics and you want to do the right thing, but financially no one's sitting there you know going hey you know what um you didn't do enough of this this month why don't you try more next month um you know i think that integrity wise that's one of my core business values is this integrity so you you know i i do what i do and i i follow through with it so i think that it's and I see the patients that I need to see. We fit them in when we need to fit them in. We do the injections we need to do. Um, the last thing I want is someone to call me and say, you did like, you know, three epidurals. Why didn't you do, why didn't you make them bilateral? You make more money that way. You know, because, well, I, I don't think, I don't think they needed them to be bilateral. I think they could have done just well just being unilateral. Whatever it is, I, I didn't want that. And I don't, I don't have that. I have the complete full autonomy. I can fire whoever I want to fire. Um, I can hire whoever I want to hire. Um, I'm the, I'm that top on that totem pole. That's me. Um, there's nobody else above me. So I know I've heard places where the clinic manager will go above the physician and talk to somebody else and rat them out and say, oh, this, this person didn't see this many patients or they were on the phone or whatever, something silly like that. That doesn't happen in my office. Um, I have kind of full control. 
So there comes the downsides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Downside is that you have full control <laughs> over everything. I mean, everything from the minute somebody calls, so the phones, the electricity, the toilets, um, the, you know, everything from that to claims. So the perfect person who would do well in this type of atmosphere is someone who's fiercely independent and um, is interested in all aspects of medicine. So not just the clinical aspect, but also the business aspect of it. And who, um, and, and I mean, I do everything in the office. I know how, how somebody scans in a credit card I, uh, to how, I mean, I call my biller and we talk about claims and, you know, I write letters of appeal and I know all my modifiers and all those kind of things. I mean, it's important to know all of that because if you don't, you can get fleeced. So if you say, okay, I want to be a solo doc, this is great. I'm going to hire, um, I'm going to hire somebody to do it for me and they can set me up and set me up with all the credentialing things if they do it all right. But then if you don't know who you're credentialed with, what your contracts look like, um, you know, you may not, that's what's making you money. So you're not going to make the money that you think you, you are going, you know, that you think you're, you're making. Um, and at the end of the day, there's a, like the biggest thing, I think my husband always says to me, he says, you know, you never complain about who you're seeing or what you see or the injections that you do or whatever, but it, you're always come, you're talking about you know, the difficulties with staff. I think that's probably the most, the, the toughest thing that, um, that I, that I encounter is hiring and firing, um, hiring and firing people. Um, it, it's tough. I mean, you to train somebody from the ground up and then have them leave six months later to train them again. I know it's so hard you get them just right where you think that they're going to be great and then they leave for like you know 50 cents more down the street or something like that um and that's been the hardest thing is really is to manage manage people but when i hire you know my goal is to hire people for life and you know i really think that this is some i you know we foster people in my office um I, get, I, I expect a lot of them, but I also expect them to, um, but we also, you know, um, take care, good care of them, you know, as well. Um, it's so important. Yeah. And, and it's not just financially, but also psychologically we take, I mean, I take care of them because I understand. I mean, I, you know, I'm a mom, I have two children. Um, I'm, I'm a spouse, you know, like it's not easy. Standing. Yes. Yeah, you know, um, and, uh, and especially, you know, being a female and working and trying to take care of kids and all that kind of stuff, whatever happens, it's, it's difficult. It's not easy. So, I mean, we try our best, um, to make sure we do that. And I think that tells a lot about a practice when they've retained staff for a long time, right? Like, you're like, okay, like they're treating their staff. Well, I, we treat our staff very well, like their family, it was like daddy daycare in our office when the kids had to do homeschooling. We're like, okay, they can take this exam room. We'll make this work. <laughs> we had seven kids at one moment all in our office, but it's important because when you have good staff, like you said, you want to retain them. And um, I think being understanding to their needs as well, like they're not just there to make money, like their family. So it's important. I like that. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, the biggest, I think downside is the financial downside of owning your practice. And I think that's what scares almost 99.9% .9 of people out there. So just to give you my background, so I'm the only person that works in my family. Um, my husband stopped working and retired um, in 2010, right? So I started working in 2011. Um, I mean, he, you know, he had, we have, an, we had enough savings, you know, to um, to last. It's not like we didn't have any savings, but we did have savings. And I think that gave us a little bit of a cushion or gave me a cushion, but that's a lot of pressure on anybody, you know, to say, okay, there's really no other, there's no one else that can kind of take the slack for you if you don't do well. Um, and that's probably more, almost everybody that decides to go into solo practice, 
you have to, and most people that do that are the only ones that are working. They're the ones providing. And I think that's what probably scares more people into going to groups or going to hospitals because they know they're getting that paycheck no matter what, right? And so they're willing to sacrifice whatever it is, the lack of autonomy, et cetera, in order to be able to make that paycheck. Um, so the when I think about one of the things that people told, told me, and I said, like, when am I going to make a paycheck? You know, when, am, when can I take stuff home? Um, you know, you get a business loan when you first come out and you decide that you want to, you want to be a solo provider. And what's nice about a business loan for physicians is that they know physicians pay it back. <laughs> so it's not very difficult to get a loan. And so that's the good thing. Um, so you find a loan. The first thing you want to do is to make yourself a business plan. So what I, what I did is to figure out whether this was something that's going to make sense to me. So I, I put on one category how it was going to be if I was going to be a solo provider and then versus all the other job offers that I had. And I compared the two to see what made sense to me financially. Um, how I did that is I listed out what my week would look like. You know, I already kind of knew what my week was like because I was with an orthopedic group anyway. So I kind of knew what my week was going to be like. And I wanted to do something that I, was realistic to me. I wrote down all my codes. I went to Medicare. I went to the fee schedule there. You know, you got to put in your um, state or wherever your locality. It's called a MAC. And so you put in your locality there and then you figure out how much is it, was it, is it going to, how much you're going to get paid if you are you know, if you're on your own. And then you add all of that up, think about like, I think a lean practice probably is about 30% um, overhead, I would say. And then, uh, you know, a little fatty practice is probably about 50 to 55. So let's take 40% as being in the middle. And then you say, okay, take, I'm going to take home 60% and 40% is going to go. The 60% of that, remember, you have some tax breaks, right? So if you own your own practice, you buy an EMG machine, you buy whatever furniture, all that stuff is, is you know, you can depreciate some of that. So you get a little bit of a break from taxes, not a ton. If you hear my dogs, I'm sorry. They're like, <laughs> they all got wet and they're like, <laughs> they're in the pool. I wonder what that is. <laughs> so, um, as long as they're quiet, that's good. So that, and then that, you know, when I saw that, I realized like, okay, at the end of the day, you know, I think I'm going to probably make more on my own than I would if I was working for anybody else. And so then that's when I decided to do that. And then when I asked my friends, you know, who were solo primary care doctors, I said, when did you start breaking even? So mm -hmm. they broke even at about a year and then they made money. So that means you're not taking anything home. Okay, so let's just make that clear. For one whole year, you are not taking anything home. So that's why you got to have, you can take a little business loan to help you pay some of that, the rent and whatever. And then the next year is when you start really making a profit. And so that first year, I mean, I think the first few months I saw like two or three patients a day, like that was it. But I worked hard. I went out and I spoke to physicians. I, um, and again, we, you know, it, it's you who they're sending patients to. Uh, and so the doctors, if you have that connection with your referring doctor, they're going to know that, okay, I want, I want you to, I want you to see my patients. And so they'll just kind of find out where you are and they continue sending people to you. So that's how I figured out how to, you know, how, how I made that decision. Um, I would say now we're like five years in and someone told me a long time ago that five years is when you're really kind of steady. I would say that's probably true. I say at five years is when, you know, you can breathe a little bit knowing that, you know, you're not going to lose it. You have, you have a good referral base. You know, you're not going to lose a lot of people unless, you know, somebody God forbid moves or something and stops practicing, then that's a problem for you. But for the most part, I think five years is that point when you think that, okay, where am I going to grow? And so that's where I'm at right now, or I'm going to think, I'm thinking to myself, where am I, where am I growing? And we are, I mean, we're growing at this point because we, you know, we're, I'm having to shove patients in and make sure that, you know, we've got um, spots to see them that, that week, if they're in a lot of pain, et cetera. 
I can talk forever. <laughs> no, that was, okay. I was trying to answer. No, that was great. Um, tell us how has the COVID pandemic affected your practice? Because we talked about it earlier, and I know for a few first um, couple of weeks, I was like, I would love to make some money this week. <laughs> like, but it happens. We're back on hopefully track, but who knows what's going to happen. But how has it affected yours? <laughs> yeah, I think that we were shut for all. I think everybody was about the same. When um, Texas was shut, we were shut. Um, we saw, uh, we quickly went into, again, because you own your own practice, you figure out what you want to do. And it's only you. So I do not have an office manager. I manage my own office. So, I mean, we are, we, I made up of, I figured out how to do telemedicine and, um, got the word out to all of our patients that this is how we were going to be able to see patients that um, we called everybody that was set up for injections, letting them know that we could not do injections. So we were running about, unfortunately, like 40% of capacity with just telemedicine um, for the first probably like a month and a half to two months. Um, I did apply for that small business loan through the government. So I did get that. So that's helped significantly to offset those couple of months um, and to retain my staff because that was what it was meant for. So it was meant for paying your staff. Um, and I'm part of my staff. So <laughs> I got a little paid to a little bit as well. Um, the um, Right now, I think we're about 80 to 90% of um, capacity. I think now is at the end of the year. I don't know if you guys are feeling this too. But I think everybody kind of postponed everything. And then now wants to get everything in. It's even worse than it was last year. Um, we have a lot more people trying to get in um, than, than they were last year, I think. So I think we'll basically make up for it, especially with the business loan. I don't know what 2021 is gonna look like, I'll be honest. Um, I think I uh, I do fear the flu season and I do fear a COVID upri you know, uprising with um, in the next few months. Um, but and again, we're prepared for it. We know what we're going to do. Um, we have plenty of PPE to be able to do injections and take care of our patients. My office, I have an in-office injection suite. So we do all of our injections in the suite anyway. Um, so I don't have to really worry about using hospital PPE, which is the major concern um with doc so overall it's been okay i think the weirdest thing about it is to try to figure out what protocols um with with staff like so again i'm the boss so when i get a call at nine o'clock saying hey i did you know i had lunch with somebody last week <laughs> and uh they tested positive for it. what do i do that's me i mean i've got to figure that out right i don't have someone to call to say what do i do um so we, we follow um, CDC guidelines, you know, just to, you know, go through the checklist and figure out, you know, are they somebody that we need to quarantine, et cetera? Do we need to quarantine the whole staff, including me? You know, what, what do we do that? So that's, that's how it's changed. It hasn't changed too much, but hopefully 2021 will be better. <laughs> I know we're both part of a group. I need to add you, Sheena, there's a private practice group on Facebook. I think that it's phenomenal. I've learned a lot of, I know we both posted things like, well, what are you guys doing? It's nice to know what other practices are. I'll add you. All right. <laughs> All right. So this is the time where we ask our audience here if they have any questions. So Carter, and you've talked a little bit about this, but so how did you learn about the business aspects of private practice and what, what resources do you recommend? So this is, the, okay. The biggest thing is how you're going to make money how am I going to get paid? So I had a disaster happen in the beginning, my first two months. So I had started, so when I had the orthopedic group, when I first started before I went to the pain group and then started my own practice, right? So I had three little lily pads that I jumped from. So the first lily pad, they, they, um, I had formed my professional association. I had my own tax ID. The second lily pad, which is the private practice pain group, decided that they didn't want to be part of Medicare. And so um, took everybody off of Medicare, um, including my tax ID, which I didn't realize. And then um, we all said, hey, you can't do that. We, we're just a growing practice. We need to take Medicare. So then they changed their, their whole um, 
outlook and they put us back in. So, but they didn't put my personal tax ID back in. So when I started my practice in 2015, oh my God, I had thousands of claim, not thousands, I had thousands of dollars of claims that were coming back. And remember I was seeing like two or three patients a day. So, um, I called my, I called the doctors. I mean, sorry, I called the insurance company and I would talk to the insurance company and I would meagerly say that I was this solo doctor that just opened her shutters, you know, <laughs> put my shingle up <laughs> two months ago and no one's paying me and please help me. I don't understand. And let me tell you, like, they're so nice to you when you just look so desperate and sound so sad. <laughs> just like, help me. Cause I have no idea what I've done wrong. I, I I've, I've seen, I've seen Medicare patients. Um, a lot of the claims management, I, that's how I learned. I would call and I had the time, right? So I had the time and I knew what medical policies were. I knew what local coverage determinations were because I asked, I said, how do I do this? I didn't ask an office manager. I didn't ask a biller. I asked insurance company. And those are the people that know that, that those are the people that pay you. So you might as well ask the people that are paying you, right? Um, I did not depend on an office manager because it's not their office, it's your office. So I want to make sure that that person is, is that I, um, I know that the people that are, sorry, I want to make sure that the people that are in my office, uh, know what they're talking about. So how do I know what they're talking about? Unless I know what they're supposed to be doing. So I would answer the phones. I knew how the phone tree worked. Um, to this day, I can alter the phone tree um, however I wanted to, want, want to do it. Um, I just did it. And that's the best way to do it. I mean, it's just like when you do residency, right? So you can read all you want. You can be book smart. And so this was my, you know, my first week out of residency. I thought I knew everything in the world. And I started and I was like, oh, crap. Like, I don't know anything. <laughs> I know nothing. So I was like, where is my attending? So that's what you do. You just learn. You make mistakes, but the beautiful thing about mistakes is that you learn from your mistakes because otherwise you're completely blind. You think you're doing the right thing and you don't know. Um, and then you're, you have, so that you have to be motivated, right. To understand and take the time out to think about your business. Um, I really do think that in, in, in the state where we are and where we are, and I can't speak for places like Wisconsin or New Jersey or any place like that. I really think that if you're a good, honest physician that does the right thing and takes care of patients, I, I mean, I hate to sound corny, but I really think that that's what, pa what primary care doctors really like. And I really think that's what patients really like. They like the fact that they can trust you and they can, you know, and so that's, that's how you keep your practice going by, it's by your quote on Friday that Dr. Baruch Salat, who was Omar's father who passed away earlier this year, he, that was his favorite quote. He's like, if you take care of the patient first and foremost, he's like, everything else is going to fall in place. He's like, take care of your patient, but you will definitely have bumps. Um, Sheena and I were kind of smiling when you said the thing about Medicare. So the same thing happened to me uh, <laughs> when I first started my Medicare number, when you're applying for Medicare, you can only apply within 60 days before your start date. And this was like a new rule that started in 2019 that no one knew. So when the, my credentialing company applied, they applied while I was still in fellowship. So, and they did an office check. They would send someone from Medicare to your office to make sure you were actually practicing so it wasn't fraud. And they showed up and it was still in July and I had just finished fellowship, but I hadn't started practice. So they're like, oh, it's Dr. Williams. And they're like, oh, she doesn't start till September. So they denied my Medicare and then you can apply for another 90 days. <laughs> so by this time I've started. So like I was hyperventilating because I didn't have my Medicare number for the first three months that I was practicing. But the good thing is, obviously, with Medicare, you have a year up to bill. So, like, we knew I was going to be able to bill, but it, like, I was hyperventilating nonetheless. But, yeah, you have those little um, bumps and bruises that you learn on the way. You learn, exactly. I think also it's important to have, you know, to, to get on those Facebook posts um, and to find somebody. Listen, every single dentist, every single chiropractor is on their own. I mean, right, how right. Many dentists is, yeah. do you see or solo. they're all solo. So yes. if they can do it, you can do it. Yeah, rocket mean, science, right? Exactly. It's but like you, you said, like dedicated. And you have to take the time. Like I was on the phone myself calling Medicare. I was like, what is the process? What do we need to do every morning? You know, but like you said, you have to 
be dedicated. I think as physicians, we get kind of spoiled because we are so focused on the medicine aspect that when you do go into practice, a lot of stuff that's done for physicians when you do join uh, maybe academia, you know, you don't know how the credentialing process. A lot of people, I would even say they don't even know how they're paid. Like they don't know <laughs> like how much they're paid. So Sheen and I, um, Omar taught us from residence, like he, every, and he still does this. We both do it. Every single patient I see, I write their name down. I write their, their, um, have a spreadsheet, <laughs> spreadsheet, write their name down, write their insurance and I write their billing code. And then we come back when we get the EOB and put every single patient exactly down to the cent, how much we're paid. So if they're not paid, then you can call your credential, your billing company and be like, why was I not paid on this patient? Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was doing my EMG fellowship, I mean, we saw four patients a day, like a day. <laughs> and that was because, I mean, we'd sit there and talk about them for right, like right. two hours. <laughs> you know, I mean, the EMG would last two or full hours. <laughs> like, look at the motor unit yeah, and like nice analyze words. it for like 30 minutes. And, <laughs> you know, and, but I mean, it was a beautiful thing to learn. Yeah, that, to learn, right. Exactly. But it just is not reality. And so it's, not and practical. most of those doctors that are in academics that really don't understand that. So, I mean, I'm, that's great that you guys are learning that because for sure that we're not, the other thing I think that we're always told, and I think unfortunately is brainwashed is that we can't do it. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. you okay, can, like physicians don't know business. They're not good oh, at business. No, 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 no. We know business. Right. You know, <laughs> come on. I mean, we know business. You have to learn it. You're not born. Like your mother didn't pop you out with like a, me with a little business degree. Medical degree. Right. <laughs> They all learned it. They all learned it somehow. There are people that are better than others, granted, but everybody can learn it. And, you know, if, if you have somebody that you can call and say, you know, to kind of coach you, but it's more like, I think, mentoring in a, in a cheerleader way, like you can do this, you've got it. You call me if you need anything, because at the end of the day, you're going to learn if you do it yourself, if you call yourself, you know, but it's always nice to have someone behind your back as well. Definitely. All right. We have another question. Apurva asks, if you could restart this journey, what would you have done or thought about differently? I would have done it in the beginning. <laughs> I would have said, screw all the other jobs I had. <laughs> <laughs> because I, gosh, I graduated in 2006 from Sinai and I'm just thinking to myself, like how much richer I would be right now. <laughs> if it's true. Because when you do know how much money you're reimbursed, you're like, I can't have someone making more money off of me than I make off myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of companies making a lot of money off of people. Definitely. Right. So I think that's what I would have done. I think I would have done right. It, it would have done, I would have just done it in the beginning. Um, I just, I don't think I had faith in myself. I think I was, um, I never even thought that was an opportunity for me because no one else did it. And um, it seemed like, okay, this is what everyone else, every single person in my residency program, every single person that I knew from medical school, they got a job somewhere. That's how they started. Um, and so I, I don't, I, and it's not that I didn't have faith in, in my abilities. I just didn't know that I could do that. And so I'm telling you, you can, it's just a matter of um, doing your research and making sure that you're willing to put in the work. You know, if you're somebody that wants to cruise in and see all your patients and cruise out and never think about who's getting paid, how are you getting paid? just take your paycheck home, then that's, this is not the, I mean, this is not the practice for you because it's tough, you know, um, to do, take care of all the other things that are in your, on your books at the end of the day. Let's see. Well, can you go into a little bit of detail about kind of what is a typical week for you in terms of schedule and what kind of patients you see? <clears throat> yeah. So I work four days a week. Um, my fifth day, um, I just started a little bit of aesthetics. Don't ask something I like to do. <laughs> and I want to hear about this later, so we'll talk. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. So that's, I used to work five days a week, but, um, the fourth, fifth day I decided 
to just do kind of more the aesthetics part of my practice. So four days a week, I see my max is 25 patients um, a day. That's all I'll see, no matter if it's injections, EMGs, you know, um, new patients, whatever, I'll just work my butt off. Um, I do take a half an hour lunch, but I, I know I start at 8.30 and I'm, and I've, my last patient I think is at 3.45 is, is ends with a new patient. Um, the first, you know, because it's um, COVID. So the first two days, uh, Monday, Tuesday, I see only telemedicine and we only do, we do follow, follow-ups, you know, um, image, images, follow-ups, post-op injection, follow-ups. Um, not any, if I, I implant um, um, stimulators. So if, obviously if it's an implant post-op, I got to see them in the office, look at their surgical wound. But if it's like a epidural or whatever, I'll see them over the phone. Um, Wednesday is all injections day. So I start at seven and I end whenever I end. So most of the times I am ending at like four. Um, most of the time I do not get a lunch. I mean, I'm just going the whole day. And then uh, Thursday is all new patients and injections, EMGs, anybody that I have to see in the office, I'll do them that day. And then Friday is kind of my spillover. So if I have, if I have to see somebody, they're in a lot of pain, et cetera, we'll see them in that that early morning and then um try to put as much of aesthetic stuff to, towards the towards that friday so that's my typical week you do your telemed from home or do you go into the office i do the, i do it at home um you know it i don't really need the whole point is to not be in the office <laughs> so if i was going to be in the office i'd be in the office right um i do i just do it from home yeah. good all right let's see Telemedicine lasts longer than I know it's been COVID. really good for right. yeah. mm -hmm. patients don't have to take half a day off to go see you and all right any other questions guys you know I just wanted to bring something up I think um in terms of my um variety of patients that I see so I'm interventional pain um, I do see, I do do med medical management, sorry, med management. I do. I, I think that if you are not associated with a, an orthopedic group or you don't have a lot of um, surgeons sending you injections, um, that you're going to have to do some type of something else other than just seeing injection patients all day long. It, there's just no way. I um, mean, well, no, I'm saying, no, I'm sorry. In, in where I, where I practice. I mean, Sheena knows. I mean, we're just like, if you trip over somebody, it's probably a pain doctor. <laughs> so, but in places where there's no pain physicians is a different story. You can pick and choose what you want to do. But for the most part where we are, um, so the patients that I choose are, you know, and I don't choose like, oh, I'm going to only see my commercial patients for medicine. I don't do that. Um, I'll say most of my patients are complicated. Most of them are Medicare. But man, they they need their medication. There's no other way. They've done everything they possibly can, and um, they've been loyal. I've been I've seen I've seen patients. You know, for nine years, I've seen patients that for medication management. Um, in a way, it at least it pays your bills. So that you know, thirty to forty percent that I was down when I couldn't do injections. At least I made a little money. You know, to um, to be able to survive. So you know, it's not, it's not like you can just, can't just roll up and say, I'm only going to see, I'm only going to do injections. I have no interest in managing any type of medications. Um, I have a friend, um, in, in another pain doc, a physiatrist who did my fellowship a year before me, and she will see everybody and anybody, even if somebody wants to, you know, wants pain management, that's only she'll see them and she'll talk about weaning a breeding protocol. And she'll say that I know for 10 years, you know, your primary doctor has been, been giving you 120 hydrocodone tens for the last 10 years for your back pain. And you've had like, right. So, I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. No one's done anything for your back ever, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what we can do for your back and let's talk about weaning you off of medicine. And, you know, I'm not going to wean you off of medicine if you're not going to feel better but you got to give yourself a chance because that's the future. The future is people getting off of these pain medications. So you don't want to be left high and dry without having some type of, you know, some type of um, net. And uh, you know, they, 
the ones that want to listen will listen. The ones that don't want to listen will leave. They'll go find somebody else. So I think it's important for you guys to kind of understand that it's not all perfect. You know, it may be perfect in some situations, but most of the times you do have to do medication management. Oh, and I I think that a lot of times chronic pain patients can kind of get a bad rap because like the ones that are loyal that are doing what they're supposed to do, they're going to be loyal to what they're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. So not all, I wanted to put that out there, not all chronic pain patients are bad or drug seeking. Mm -hmm. Like they're literally have something wrong and they need a medication to treat it, just like hypertension right. or diabetes. You know, I had one fire ant bite, like one on my foot. <laughs> and they're horrible, huh? Oh my God. For five days, every night I sat there. I thought that my world was going to die. And I had one fire ant bite on my left foot and I couldn't, I was like, how do people sleep with neuropathy? How do people sleep with radiculopathy? I had a, I had a general surgeon come in my office over and on a Monday looking like someone had beat him up. He hadn't slept for three days. He's like, I have this pain down my left arm. I got an I got an MRI and I have a disc, a C56. Please help me. And yeah, an like, acute oh, radic. Yeah, there's nothing like, like acute radic coming in. <laughs> you know, and Wednesday, Monday, you know, his pain started on a Friday. I injected him on a Wednesday. I mean, to this day, he comes in every time he follows, he comes and goes, Thank you so much. He's like, you know, I I never realized how much pain people have. And he goes, It's not like surgical pain. I go, no, it is not like surgical pain. Nerve pain mm -hmm. is not like surgical pain. Nerve pain is the worst because <laughs> yeah. you can't get comfortable. Like you said, like you, any move you make, like you feel it. Your body's like, nope, mm -mm, can't, can't right. sleep, can't do anything. So, cool. Yeah. So I think that, you know, you're right. It, it, and people get become very desperate and it's, and that's when we have to kind of be able, that's a training, right? That's involved with the figuring out. It's very difficult. Even as an addiction psychiatrist, I think it's hard to figure out who's addicted versus who is untreated or poorly treated, um, et cetera. So I, I think it's always, it's always difficult, but I think that we would be doing a disservice if we didn't acknowledge that people have pain and that they, some of them really have tried everything that they possibly can and need to be able to walk to the bathroom to pee, you know, on their own. I have a good friend, she's a physician and she's a sickle seller. And like, I empathize with her so much, you know, she'll go to the ER with a sickle cell crisis and she won't tell people she's a doctor. And like the way she's treated sometimes, I've had to get on the phone. I'm like, did she tell you that she is a physician? <laughs> and like things change like that when they find out her physician. But I'm like, it shouldn't be that way, right? Um, no, it is that's a whole nother talk. Sorry. <laughs> another talk. <laughs> but Carter has another question. Mm -hmm. Yep, he has. So I've heard of private practices being driven out by large healthcare systems. Have you seen that happen? And is that something that worries you? Um, I think so. The reason why you get bought out is because you run a fatter practice, right? So you run something that's like 60% overhead. You've got somebody that's like wiping the sweat off your brow. You're paying them seven, you know, five days a week. Maybe you have two receptionists in the front where you really need one. And so you don't have that ability to, um, to take a hit if you need to. And, um, and I see that's like for now with COVID, the places that are closing are the ones that have a higher overhead because they cannot, they don't know how to manage with a smaller overhead. So I've been through three um, practice managers in the last four, four months. The first one was awesome. She just couldn't drive an hour and a half each way. She got to found, found a nicer, uh, I'm sorry, closer job. The other two had like, no, they could not do 25% of what I asked them to do, which is what I was doing being a physician, um, you know, full time. So, you know, when you have a lot of staff, it's really difficult to be able to take hits. Um, when you look at corporate medicine, it's, there's so much fat. Like the BMI is like 55. <laughs> <laughs> right, it is. Okay. I mean, the fat is huge. I mean, right. you have to pay somebody to call somebody to pay somebody to call someone else. I mean, it's ridiculous. And it's, this is why we're in the problems where we are, where, it, where a saline bag costs 50 bucks. Um, you know, anyway, I, I, I could go on. But that is why, you know, 
when you have too much of a fatty practice, you end up having to close because you cannot manage. So I watch every dollar. I mean, if Medline increases my syringes by five CC syringes by 15 cents, I'm calling my rep. I'm like, you, you that was 15 cents. <laughs> and it adds up. He brings it down. I mean, you just can't just keep ordering it. I mean, I order off of Amazon. I order off, I mean, I have three different vendors. I compare and contrast all my vendors. Uh, you know, you've, you've just got to do that. So I am not worried about, you know, Baylor or UT or um, THR or, you know, Methodist or any of those practices. Um, again, um, it, you count um, the, it, they come to you, not THR. So the patients don't care if you're part of, you're a THR physician, doesn't give them any, it doesn't give you any, or them, they, they don't care. They care because you're you. So at the end of the day, you'll always be busy if you're a good doc, you know? Excellent advice. Possible. <laughs> All right, one more quick question. Not so quick, I guess, but um, have you ever thought, you know, you've been solo for these many years. Have you ever thought of adding to your practice, either hire another mid-level or another physician? So I did, I hired a mid-level about a couple years ago. Um, and I thought, you know, it wasn't the best choice. I think it would have been a better choice if I had found a different mid-level. But um, now over the last couple of years, I've decided um, that I'm just going to be loyal to my physicians. I think that mid-levels, that scope creep is just way too high. Um, and we are a rare breed. I mean, talk about rare breeds. I mean, we have the orthopedic background. We have a neurological background. We have physiatrist background. I don't think there's anybody that can replace our knowledge base. And so it's very difficult for me to say, oh yeah, let me just train somebody for six months so that they can replace me to decide whether I sh they should do an L5 epidural versus a, you know, look for something else. I mean, that's insane. So I, 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 I'm, I, I, at this point, what we're doing is I'm going to look for a, a, another physician. I think that's probably the best um, fit for my practice. You know, you, you start just like I would, you know, an eat, eat to kill model, that kind of thing. Um, uh, share in the overhead and, you know, that's how our practice is. Or, yeah, we're, that's how our, exactly how our practice is. Omar started as a solo practice and then 10 years into practice, he, or, um, he added land and then, but we're all our each individual practice. Like mm -hmm. I work, Team our Fort Worth is our marketing, who we market as a group, but like we each bill under our own name. We'll cover, you know, we cover inpatient rehab for each other, but um, yeah, we just share overhead ultimately. So that's how you help keep our practice lean. It's like the more people we add, the leaner we can be. But yeah, we try to run like at between a 30 to 40%. And um, yeah, so it's helpful. But yeah, we eat what we eat, you what we kill. So Omar, I remember when I first started, he's like, you can work as much as you want or as little as you want, as long as you pay your bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so if you want to take a month off and you want to go to whatever tibet and uh meditate for you know a month mm -hmm. go for yeah. it you still have to pay your bills <laughs> <laughs> make sure your bills stay the month. Yep. well um last question for you we asked all of our guests if you were not a pmnr physician what would you be I know that was a hard question I was thinking about. Um, I, I've always wanted to be a physician ever since I was a little kid. So um, if I wasn't PMNR, I would probably want to do something like plastics. But if I wasn't a physician, I think I, and I, this is my second career, just watch for it in about 20 years. Um, I'm going to go to fashion school and become a fashion designer. That's my career. Mm hmm you're going to say artist. So Dr. Bandari has like this beautiful artwork in her office and it's all like she has painted it herself. And she's yeah, I've been painting it. since I was eight. So yeah. I, I've been very creative. Yeah, but I, I like, <laughs> painting, but I like sewing and, and uh, fashion a lot more. It's why. Make us a scrub line then. Was that? I you can make a scrub line. Scrub line. That's what everybody <laughs> says. <laughs> you're hiding your, your scrub. <laughs> I don't have mine on today took my logos off. <laughs> Very oh, good. Man. This was so, so much fun. So many so great uh, pearls. Thank you so much for all your great advice. We will definitely post this on our YouTube and IGTV as well. So um, thank you again.
thanks so much for having me. It was, it was great. And, uh, you know, wishing everybody best of luck with, uh, with the next year ahead. Hopefully 2021 is a blessed one for all of us. We can actually get together in real life. Huh? <laughs> that would be nice. It would. Oh, so, so, so um, go ahead. Go ahead if anyone has any questions, you know, if they're watching and they have any questions and they would like to contact you about either a possible job or um, anything about private practice, you know, what, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, so they, you can, they can just call. I mean, my email is pretty easy. It's satyabandari at gmail.com. So um, are you guys, well, my name is, I guess, on there, but you'll put my name on something, right? Yeah. On, yeah. 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 <laughs> my first and last name at gmail.com. You're welcome mm -hmm. to, and if you want advice or whatever, just, just we'll say thank them. you. They're all say thank you on the yes, lives. <laughs> um, you guys were excited to have a new IG takeover this week. LSU Yay. will be participating on Tuesday. So um, it's a perfect time to do it because I know that interview season is right around the corner. Um, please reach out to us to showcase your program if you are interested in doing it. So next Sunday, we will have Dr. Annie Guthrie. She is a intern and she'll be at Northwestern starting her PMNR residency. And um, we excited to hear how um, joining PMNR, she heard about it late in her medical school career and um, still matched into a great program. So we look forward to hearing from her. Have a good week, everyone. All right, guys.